as uh, many of you know because you've worked with me, um, I work on this long-term Rocky Intertidal Monitoring Project. And part of what we do is monitor the ochre star, Pisaster ochreatius, which has um, had some pretty severe declines in recent years due to sea star wasting disease. So a lot of you have heard me talk about this already, so I won't go into details about the disease itself, but I just want to give a brief update on what we've seen in terms of populations and recovery. So these are all of the sites um, going from Washington to Southern California where we are currently monitoring ochre stars and we even have a few sites up in Alaska. And um, this range pretty much spans the entire range of the ochre star. And at each of these sites, as many of you have done, we count and measure, we get um, what we call the radius of the stars. So the, um, the distance from the middle of the star to the tip of the longest or straightest arm. Oftentimes they're, they're not nicely laid out like this. Um, and then we also get disease categories for the stars. And um, this is a, a very general overview of every site where we have uh, Pisaster data for. So let's see if I can get this to work. I don't want to poke anybody in the eye. Um, so basically what I'm showing here are all of our sites going from north to south, and I had to break this up into two pieces because it, it wouldn't all fit in the long line. But these are grouped, these are sites in Alaska, these are Washington sites, Oregon, Northern California, Central California. These are Channel Islands sites. We have a big group, the Channel, I Channel Islands National Park, that has a number of sites um, on those offshore islands, and then Southern California. And really the, the takeaway picture here, so this, these are data going from 2000 to 2015 um, in both figures. And what we're looking at is changes in ochre star abundance over time. So these light colored boxes, those indicate periods where there's been very little change in the population. These dark red boxes, those are where we've seen significant declines. And this is a log scale, so these really dark boxes, that indicates that the population has just crashed. And the important thing here is this line here marks 2013, and that's when we first started to see evidence of wasting syndrome at many of our sites. And you can see that across the board, all the way from Alaska, all the way down to Southern California, we've seen these major declines. So that's across the entire, nearly the entire range of the ochre store. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, because the theme of this forum was climate change, I thought I should talk a little bit about this potential temperature link that I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, this idea that there's, um, that temperature could play a role in the emergence and severity of, of this disease has come from prior wasting events. Um, sea star wasting syndrome is not a new thing. It's something that we've seen primarily in Southern California. It, it, crop, it has cropped up periodically um, and very well associated with, uh, with warm water events, so primarily during El Nino years. And so this is something that um, a number of groups have looked for is, is a potential correlation with warm water for the current event. And the results have been kind of mixed. Um, Drew Harvell's group, her student Morgan Eisenlord, um, and some others did some work both in the field and in the lab that suggested that warmer water temperatures did, um, in, were indeed associated with um, with emergence of, of uh, sea star wasting disease and increased severity of the disease. Um, ben Miner, my, my husband, one of his students here at Western Washington, did some lab experiments that showed that keeping stars at cooler water temperatures um, kind of slowed the progression of the disease, whereas warm temperatures um, increased the severity and, and individuals died more quickly at warm temperatures. Bruce Mangi's group, um, who's, he's down in Oregon, he kind of found an opposite result, that when they first started to see uh, signs of disease at their sites in Oregon, 
water temperatures were actually pretty cool and well within the range of normal. And so he sort of feels like, at least in that area, that the temperature may not have as strong of a role. And so this is something that we wanted to look at kind of in a very general way with our data. And we have temperature loggers in the intertidal at many of our sites. The, the temperature data is shown here with the red lines. The blue lines are Pisaster abundance um, data over time. And again, this is going from Alaska, these are Washington sites, Oregon, um, Northern California, Central California, and then down into Southern California. And we started out with this very, looking at this very general pattern. So um, we're looking at, at many of our sites, we only survey uh, uh, these sites once, sometimes twice a year. So we started out by looking at annual mean abundance of, of ochre stars. So this is again going from 2000 to 2015. Um, and we compared that to the annual mean temperature over time. And what jumped out right away was this surprisingly strong correlation between temperature and um, decline in ochre stars. And it was surprising to us because we were kind of, based on our field observations, we were kind of in the Bruce Mangy camp where when we first started to see signs of wasting syndrome, we felt like water condi conditions were, um, were pretty much in the range of, of normal temperatures. Um, and so one of the issues with looking at things on this very uh, broad scale, so taking temperatures over an entire year and summarizing it into one value, is that that's probably not the, the, um, the conditions that the sea stars are responding to. They're probably responding to daily or weekly or seasonal changes. So we kind of did the next best thing um, that we could and looked at some of our sites, so these are, these bars represent mean pisaster abundance um, in the two seasons that we sample sea, star, uh, sea stars at central California sites. So the kind of greenish bars are spring sa surveys and um, the, I guess they're orange here, are um, fall surveys. So that gives us a little bit better resolution for um, for what the ochre star populations are doing. And then this squiggly line is mean daily water temperatures. And so if we look at when we first started to see sea star wasting disease at those central California sites, the water temperatures, if you look at these, these peach colored bars, um, they're well within the range of normal for, for this period when we first started to see signs of disease. And it wasn't until later when we had the, the warm water blob and the El Nino event that we got these really high water temperatures. And at that point, the sea stars had, had um, you know, already died in a lot of these places. So I guess the take home message is that temperature um, likely does play a role in some areas, but it's much less clear what that role is in this event. And um, so this disease event seems to be more complicated than, um, than prior events. The other thing to notice here is that, and this is something that just kind of jumped out at us, is there's been this gradual decline at these sites. And we're wondering if it's, you know, if it's possible that this disease has been around for a number of years and has been affecting um, these populations at very low levels, levels that, that we might have missed. And then it was only later, I mean, we've got these, these big declines that are um, more correlated with, with when water temperatures warmed. So still lots of, lots of uh, work to, to kind of get to the bottom of, of the role of temperature. Yeah, do you have a question about that last one? Right. Yeah, no, and that's, that's kind of where we were trying to get with this to, to see whether this, even though these temperatures are within the range of normal, if they were higher than prior fall temperatures, but that, that doesn't appear to be the case. Yeah, but, but 
yeah, just looking at mean temperature is not always the best way to look at things. Often it's the, the deviation from mean, but we did look at it both ways and it didn't really make a difference. So, yeah. So the other piece of the, um, the Pisaster Acratia story is recovery. And some of you may have read recent reports that people are finding huge numbers of recruits at their sites, larger than they've ever seen before in the past, and this is kind of um, making the, the outlook for recovery seem pretty good, at least in some areas. And if we look at our data across this whole range, again going from Alaska to Northern California and then Central California down to Southern California, these bars are now representing the number of juveniles that we counted at each site going from 2000 to 2015. And again, this is that 2013 line when we first started to see the disease. Um, and what you notice is that there are some areas that, that have had pretty good, pretty consistent recruitment for a number of years. And there are even some sites where, um, in this case, the darker bars are, are better. That's, that's higher numbers of juveniles. Um, so there are some sites where we've got pretty good recruitment um, post sea star wasting disease. But that, that isn't the pattern across the board. So there are lots of areas where we haven't seen a lot of recruitment. And I think this is looking even worse than it actually is because I think some of these bars aren't showing up. But, um, but so there's that piece that even where we're seeing recruitment, it's, it's kind of patchy. Uh, in space and time. And then there's this whole portion of the species range where we're not seeing any, or very little to, to no recruitment at all. And so that's, that's a pretty big deal that, um, you know, there's this, this whole big area where, uh, where things are still looking pretty grim for, for the ochre stars. The other um, piece, or the other key to, um, to recovery is the survivorship of juveniles. And there hasn't been a lot of work looking at juvenile survivorship. There was a good study that was actually done up in the Vancouver area by Sewell and Watson in 1993, where they, um, they just happened to witness this big recruitment event and followed these individuals over the next um, couple years. And they estimated that uh, about 97% of those individuals that, that they first picked up in that first year, when they followed them um, across the following year, that about 97% of those died. And then in the successive years, that mortality was near 100%. If you look at, this is, um, these are data from one of our Central California sites. What this is showing now is time on the y-axis, so 2000 to 2015. These are ochre star sizes. So this is going from zero to 200. Um, and you can see that in 2014, so right after we saw that big decline, we got this big pulse of recruits. And you can see that pulse of recruits, they kind of grow up and transition from, um, from juveniles. So juveniles are, we're calling those anything that's about this big, so 30 millimeters in radius or smaller. Um, they trans transitioned from juveniles to small adults. So they're getting to the size where they can actually start to be reproductive and contribute to, um, to repopulating these areas. And if we look at the actual numbers, we were seeing um, about 25% of the individuals surviving to this next size class. So that's, that's good news. Um, it's not something that we're seeing everywhere, but um, but that's something that we're able to follow with these size data. So that's kind of the, I guess I've got a summary slide. So to kind of summarize the, the broad patterns, um, sea star wasting disease has had a major impact on ochre star populations throughout its entire range along the Pacific coast of North America. The role of temperature is still somewhat unclear. It seems to um, be important in some areas and maybe not as much in others. Uh, recruitment post sea star wasting disease has been um, relatively high at some sites, 
but again has been restricted largely to that northern portion of its range and um, is patchy even in the north. And um, as of now, our juvenile survivorship rates are higher than, than previous estimates, at least in some areas. But the disease is still around, and so it kind of remains to be seen whether these individuals survive for the long term. So the next bit that I want to get into is um, one of the things that, that we've done recently is we've gotten all the data that a lot of you have helped collect um, publicly available on our website. So if you go to, um, this is our, our main web page, if you go to PacificRockyInterTitle.org, this is what you'll get. Um, and I wanted to show you how to access these data and kind of use a couple local sites as, as examples of how we've seen variation in, um, in ochre star abundance and recruitment locally as well. So um, to access these data, you go to this left sidebar and you go to something called, I apologize, this is a really small font, but that says interactive map and graphing tool. And then you get this page where you've got a map of all our sites. The citizen science sites aren't quite up there yet, but we will get them there. Um, but for now, you can go to, um, to this graphing tool to, to find the data and you select uh, species count data, or that's, that's what we'll do for this example. And then you can find the site. There's a list of all the sites. They're roughly north to south. Things get a little weird in the state of sea because of all the islands. And so um, you can just start, if you know your site name, you can just start typing it in and it'll come up. But um, we'll look at the Point Whitehorn County Park. You select sea star as the target species. And for this example, we'll look at Pisostrocratius and select all seasons. And then we'll look at a column graph. And so this is what the trends um, have looked like at the, the Point Whitehorn County Park sign, or site. Um, we started off with pretty good numbers, so that's an 80 there. And then we saw that big decline in um, summer of 2014. And then there was this little blip here. So we'll look at the size data for this site to kind of explain what, what's going on there. So to look at size data, everything's the same except for this top option. You, you select species size data. And that will give you one of these bubble plots. And these are sizes from 0 to 200. So you can see in that first survey, we had this really nice size distribution with um, big individuals as well as some small and then everybody pretty much disappeared um, two months later and then we had this little blip of individuals that are in the 20 to, to 30 uh, millimeter size range and unfortunately at this site it looks like a lot of those guys didn't survive um, these dates are not uh, spread out uh, relative to, to when we actually surveyed. They're just, um, they're just equal distance, uh, just uh, regardless of how far apart they are. But this, from this survey, so this is December of 2014, and this is May 2016, it is possible that some of these individuals were these guys that recruited um, bef sometime before December. It used to be from, from what was available in the literature that we thought that individuals that are about this big were two to three years old. Our more recent estimates from the field suggest that growth rates could be really variable and actually could be much higher in some areas. So, um, so it's possible that these guys are survivors. It's also possible that these recruited in from, um, from areas that were uh, adjacent to the plots or to the plot at that site. Um, and then I wanted to show trends at one other local site because they're really different. So this is Larrabee State Park. And um, you can see that numbers have jumped around a lot there. This is going from zero to 350. And if we look at the size data for this site, you can see initially we had that, that nice size distribution for the first couple. So this is um, January 2014 and May 2014. And then uh, we had the big die-off in um, summer 2014, although there were still 
some individuals around. But then we had this huge recruitment event. There were hundreds of little tiny stars at Larrabee. And um, a number of these survived. These, this was six months later. The most, I don't have our most recent sample up yet, but um, there were far fewer stars, but still a good number. So there, there's still some survivors there. So that kind of gives you an idea of just how variable um, these patterns can be uh, locally. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you, so if uh, another way to, to access these data is to go to back to our main website. Um, and we've got a, a um, link here to, this says collaborative monitoring. And if you click on that, you get a page that talks about this, um, this collaborative monitoring, sea star monitoring effort. So we've got some information that's above here that I didn't show. And then all the groups that are doing this monitoring are listed. And here's the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve um, Committee. And your sites are down here. And there's links um, similar to what's shown up here to your sites. And if you click on those, then you get a link to a graph that looks like this. And this is showing ochre star abundance over time. And then this is um, Evisterius, which I forget the common name for. Modeled star, thank you. Um, and you can get to that link, the interactive map and graphing tool from, from this graph as well. So that's all I have for my, my update for what we're seeing on that broad scale and, and more locally. Are there any questions? I'm going to go. <laughs> I'll get you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so that's something that we're doing, and it's something I've talked about in, in past um, talks to this group. It's, it will take a couple years in a lot of cases to get the, the data that, that we need to, um, to be able to assess that. But we do have what we call biodiversity surveys. So what we do is we lay transects across the intertidal from the high to the low. And, um, and then we record at intervals along those transects what species are there. And what that gives us is kind of a map of who's there and how abundant they are. And we can use that to see how that's changed over time. So these are surveys that we've been doing for 15, 20 years. Um, so we have the, the uh, data prior to when wasting syndrome affected these, these sea star populations. And we can go back now and resurvey those sites and look for patterns for um, patterns of change. And my suspicion is that we will see striking changes in some areas. So um, I'm sure you've heard about you know mussels taking over the intertidal, and that that's an idea that that gets um, expressed a lot. We have had a few sites where we've already seen pretty dramatic changes in mussel cover. Um, but that's definitely not what we're seeing across the board. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to go back and, um, and look at these changes and uh, kind of look at what other factors, because there's, you know, sea stars are an important factor for, for controlling or driving patterns of, um, of various intertidal species. But there's lots of other factors that are important too. And so my guess is that we're going to see different patterns in, in different areas. So yeah, that's something that we're working on and there's other groups that are that are looking at that as well. Uh, yeah. Sunflower star. Yeah, that's interesting, though. So you feel like 
Anthropleur is actually higher in the intertidal than it was before. Because they. Yeah, it's just an interesting pattern. I mean, you'd almost expect the reverse, that they would move down farther. Um, so they're again, it's... Down, down, uh, it up, that's what I mean, though. It yeah. seems like the reverse pattern would make a little more sense for a species like Pycnopodia that, that really is primarily subtitle. I mean, we do find it in the intertidal, and it used to be very common at Cherry Point. Um, yeah, so Pycnopodia is one of these species that it it's probably the species that's been hardest hit by wasting disease. And um, there are areas like Cherry Point where it used to be abundant and we're, we're just not seeing it anymore. Um, we have had a lot of reports recently of people finding pretty good sized Pycnopodia, um, not nearly the numbers that they were at before the disease hit. But, um, but my impression for that species is it's one that's maybe kind of a boom and bust species where it, it has the ability to get really abundant and then um, I'm hoping can, can recover you know, relatively quickly from, from these sorts of uh, events. But it seems to be a fast grower. Um, so, but yeah, it's one that, that has been really hard hit. So that's interesting. And it's one of these things where, is it just a, a correlation that there's actually something else going on that's correlated with the, um, yeah. Yeah, so one of the graduate students in the lab that I work in, that was one of the, w when we were initially seeing the disease emerge in various areas, because the, the pattern of emergence was really interesting. We, we first saw it on the outer coast of Washington, and then it was about, I don't know, four or six months later that we, didn't, that we finally saw it in the inner coastal waters in the, the Salish Sea. Um, and then the kind of the next big place that we saw it was down in Central California, and then it seemed to kind of crop up in Southern California. Oregon, it was a whole year later before we saw um, real evidence of the disease. And um, I'm working with somebody in BC, and he said that at his sites, it really was 2015 when they saw the big die-offs. So it doesn't seem to be something that that spread, you know, in a in a normal way that, that we'd expect from diseases, unless there were these multiple entrance points. Um, so, so uh, Monica Morich, who's the graduate student I mentioned, she tried to look at um, at these patterns uh, of emergence in relation to things like temperature and um, traffic. Uh, like boat traffic that would relate to things like spread by, by ballast water. Um, she looked at distance to nearest um, big cities as, you know, thinking about how it might be spread by humans and, you know, in, in some other way. She couldn't find anything that really was a strong correlate. And, um, you know, I, I showed that pattern of those slowly declining numbers in Central California. and. 
that's one possibility is that the disease was already everywhere and then there maybe were these other factors that kind of stress the stars at different levels in these various areas and that's really when we saw the, the disease crop up. There's just so much that we don't understand about the disease right now that it's really hard to make guesses about why we saw it in certain areas and um, but yeah that's definitely something that people have thought about. Yeah and and just to to talk about the virus a little bit because the um, the the cause is often attributed to this denso virus which has been identified by Ian Hewson at Cornell. And the 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 strongest evidence for that are these um, transmission studies that they did in the lab, but it's still, it's really, it's, it's not a clear cut story. And so, um, so for example, a lot of the, the individuals that, that weren't showing any signs of disease had pretty high levels of this densovirus. So th again, there's still a lot that we, that we don't understand about the disease. And it's very likely that it's multiple factors that are influencing 